In this lecture, we're going to look at the conductivity of transition metal compounds, which are arguably among the most interesting of conductors. So we're going to go back once again to our table of the conductivities of select materials. And if you remember from a couple of lectures back, I pointed out that nickel oxide and titanium oxide both take the rock salt structure. They both have partially filled orbitals, but yet their conductivities are widely different, 13 orders of magnitude different. And the explanation for this divergence in the conductivities of these two materials basically comes back to electron-electron repulsions. And so let's take a closer look at that. Now, if we were to think about a square lattice of titanium three plus ions, each having one d electron. And now let's turn on conductivity. So for conductivity to happen, an electron has to move from one titanium atom to another. And of course, when it does that, the ion where the electron moves to now gains uh, another electron and it becomes a titanium two plus ion. Whereas the titanium ion that lost an electron becomes a titanium four plus. The key takeaway point is that the electrons are no longer optimally separated, right? On that titanium two plus atom, we now have two electrons. And so they're going to feel a repulsion from one another. And that repulsion is going to be important in thinking about the conductivity. How can we model these electron-electron repulsions? Well, we're going to use something called a Hubbard model. And in the Hubbard model, we're only going to consider the repulsions between electrons on the same site. We're going to neglect longer range electron-electron interactions. Now, if we were talking about a gas phase atom, we could actually determine the on-site repulsion from the ionization energies of the metal ions of interest. So for example, if we were to think about titanium 3 plus going to titanium 4 plus plus an electron, right? That's just the ionization energy of a titanium three plus ion. And so you can look that up. It's 43.3 electron volts. If we were to think about the site where the electron jumps to, where the titanium three plus goes to a titanium two plus, well, that's really just the electron affinity of a titanium three plus ion or here I'm calling it the electron gain enthalpy. So that's the negative of the third ionization of titanium. And so that's minus 29.3 electron volts. If I add these two equations together, I've got two titanium three plus ions go to titanium four plus and titanium two plus. Right? That's the, what we saw in our picture on the previous slide. And the energy of that is 14 electron volts, which we get from summing up uh, the ionization energy and the electron affinity of the titanium 3 plus ion. Well, 14 electron volts is pretty big, right? The band gap of silicon is just one electron volt by comparison. So, so this is a substantial penalty that we're paying to move the electrons closer together. Now, in a solid like titanium oxide, the U is not going to be this big. It's not going to be 14 electron volts. It's going to be something on the order of maybe two to five electron volts. And there are two reasons why it's smaller. First of all, the surrounding lattice can relax or polarize in response to the movement of charge. Right? So for example, the oxygen ions could move closer to the titanium four plus and away from the titanium two plus. And that will reduce the energy penalty. And then also the electron wave functions are more spread out in an extended solid or even in a molecule than they would be for an isolated gas phase atom. And so that also reduces the electron-electron repulsions. And so these two things um, make a big difference and that lowers the U from 14 eV. And at that level, everything's going to be insulating to something that might be just a couple eV. Okay, now... The other thing we want to look at is the width of the band. Let's take a titanium nitride sheet. Right here we've got titanium 3 plus, and we can look at the overlap of 
let's say, the titanium DXY band at gamma, here where it's bonding, and at M, where it would be antibonding. Okay, so this band is going to have a certain width. What we're going to do in the Hubbard model is we're going to compare the band width to the size of the Hubbard U, that is the electron-electron repulsions. So here are two extremes. In one case, let's say that the titanium atoms were pretty far apart, or for whatever reason their overlap or interaction was weak. In that case, we're going to get relatively narrow bands. And if the band width is smaller than the Hubbard U, then it's really like we have a gap. All right, so I should say something about the Hubbard model. It's really a model for a single band system. And when we have upper and lower Hubbard bands, we're actually, um, they can only hold one electron each. But the key thing we want to look at here is that the electron-electron on-site repulsion, the Hubbard U, is bigger than the bandwidth. That's going to lead to a filled band and an empty band. That's going to give us a gap. And in that case, we're going to get an insulator. It's called a Mott-Hubbard insulator because it is insulating due to electron-electron repulsions. On the other hand, if there's a lot of overlap of the titanium du orbitals and we have a band width, W, that's larger than the Hubbard U, then you see you have partially filled bands rather than a filled and an empty band. And that's going to lead to metallic behavior. So we see when we talk about the conductivity of transition metal compounds, what's important are the band width and the electron-electron repulsions, which we estimate with the Hubbard U. Okay. Now let's look at the behavior of some real compounds to try and put this into focus. So we can look at metal oxides that have the rock salt structure. And just to remind you about the rock salt structure, if we think about the octahedra, we would see that each octahedron shares all of its edges with neighboring octahedra. Okay, so we're going to have the oxide bands down here, and then we have the metal D bands, and that's where all the interesting stuff happens. In the rock salt structure, the T2G bands are wider than the EG bands, and the reason why is because there's this overlap across the shared edges. The T2G orbitals, like the DXY, point toward the edges of the octahedron, and they overlap with each other, as we just saw a couple of slides back when we looked at that titanium nitride layer. The filling depends on the electron count. So if we start with titanium oxide, TiO, that has a D2 configuration. Here's our titanium-titanium distance. And then what I've got in this column right here is the maximum in the radial distribution function. So we're just using this as a proxy for how large the d orbitals are. Titanium oxide, as we've already established, is actually metallic. If we go to vanadium oxide, where the vanadium 2 plus ion has a D3 electron count, we see something that looks like basically semi-metallic behavior. It's kind of at the borderline between a metal and a semiconductor. When we then go to uh, MnO, which has a D5 count, we see that what's happening is the manganese ions are now you know, farther away. Manganese 2 plus is actually larger than titanium 2 plus. Yet the D orbitals are getting a little bit smaller. But the behavior now is clearly that of a semiconductor. And also we see antiferromagnetism, which is oftentimes associated with a semiconductor. And the semiconductor behavior is evident across the rest of the series. The d orbitals keep shrinking, although the distance between transition metal ions isn't really changing a lot. It goes down a little bit, but not by the same percentage as the contraction of the d orbitals. And this contraction of the d orbitals reduces the overlap up between them, and that's going to reduce the bandwidth. At the same time, because the d orbital is getting smaller, to put two electrons in the same orbital, we pay a bigger penalty u. So bandwidth is going down and U is going up, and that's why we see 
only metallic behavior for TiO and not for the later transition metal, uh, rock salt oxides. Now let's look at the conductivity properties of perovskites with transition metal ions. Remember back in chapter 6, we talked about the perovskite band structure at some detail. Right? So we have our you know, oxygen bands down here. And then once again, the interesting part here is where we have the, the D bands. So we have the T2G bands, which are more narrow than the EG bands here because we don't have this metal-metal bonding across the shared edge. Now we only have shared corners, and because of that, there's no metal-metal interactions. And the bandwidth really just comes back to the strength of the interaction with the oxygen. And remember that the EG bands are sigma antibonding bands, and the T2G bands are pi antibonding bands. So the EG bands are wider. Well, here are the properties of a number of first-row transition metal ions in perovskite structures. The upper half of the table shows different transition metal ions that have a 3-plus charge. And so we go from uh, no electrons in scandium to progressively adding electrons to the d orbitals. As we go across, we are seeing the semiconducting behavior everywhere. So this is telling us that the Hubbard U must be bigger than the bandwidth. Only when we get to lanthanum nickel oxide do we see metallic behavior. And what's going on? Well, in part, the 3 plus oxidation state is quite a high oxidation state for nickel. And so you get a lot of covalency with the oxygen. And then notice also that you have this partially filled EG band, which we said is going to be wider than the T2G band. Now, we could have seen perhaps metallic behavior for LAMNO3 because we only have one electron in the EG orbitals there, but LAMNO3 does a cooperative Jan Teller distortion. So that D4 electron count leads to a Jan Teller distortion, and that serves to make the bands more narrow and it localizes the electrons. Now, we could, of course, see a Jan Teller distortion with a nickel 3 plus. But instead of a Jan Teller distortion, what the compound does to relieve that instability is it just delocalizes the electrons in the EG orbitals. Interestingly, if we look at perovskites where we have a 4 plus ion instead of a 3 plus ion, now what we see is metallic behavior is the rule rather than the exception. And so you might be wondering why that is. And in part, it's because the 4-plus oxidation state leads to more covalency with the oxygen. You know, 4-plus ions are smaller, they're more highly charged. So we get this larger covalency with the oxygen, and that's going to make the bands wider. And that increase in bandwidth is enough to maintain metallic conductivity for several of these. Now, strontium titanate is semiconducting because there's no electrons in the d orbitals. And strontium manganate is semiconducting because now at the D3 configuration, we have half-filled T2G orbitals. And so if you think about what the Hubbard U looks like, if you go from manganese 4 plus, which has a D3 electron count, and we're going to take an electron and move it from one manganese 4 to another site, now you're going to get manganese 3 plus and manganese 5 plus. For the electron that ends up going to make manganese 3 plus, where are you going to put it? Well, manganese 3 plus, that, that's usually a high-spin D4 ion. So you have to take that electron and put it up into the EG orbitals, and that's going to make the U especially large. Right? So when you have ions that have half-filled electron configurations, we end up with especially large U's for those electron configurations, and that's why strontium MnO3 is a semiconductor and not a metal. If we go down to the 4D transition metals, the second time through the transition metal series, we see metallic behavior almost across the board, except for when we have no electrons in the d orbitals, like in KNBO3, or 
when we get to uh, this lanthanum rhodium O3 where we have six electrons in the d orbitals. So the six electrons is enough to fill up the T2G orbitals, leave the EG orbitals empty, and in that compound we get a diamagnetic semiconductor.